In homes throughout Britain, thousands of secret crimes take place. Child sexual abuse is a private matter, a very private matter. So there are realistically no eyewitnesses to it. But for many, child sexual abuse is literally unspeakable. A terrible crime, terribly easy to deny. People can't take it emotionally. It's easier not to recognize abuse than to recognize abuse. The past 10 years have seen judicial inquiries and wholesale changes in the law, yet children are no better protected. We still don't know how best to protect children. We don't know how best to get them through the legal system so that their voices are heard. Why is society still unwilling to confront child sexual abuse? Why, after a decade of upheaval from Cleveland to Orkney, are families better protected than the children who grow up within them? I moved to Cleveland when I was nearly seven and lived there until I was 16. Um, I was the eldest of several children and my father was a manager of a local business. As a child I was in ballet classes and went to girl guides. As a family most of us went to church. Throughout my childhood, my father was sexually abusing me and physically abusing me and emotionally abusing me. I suffered it for 17 years because the grown-ups around me wouldn't make it stop. What happened in Cleveland should not have happened and must not be allowed to happen again. This is an indictment of certain individuals within the health service and an indictment of certain individuals within the social services. If the truth were known, then I think Cleveland would be an even greater scandal than people already imagine it to be. For 10 years, Cleveland has been shrouded in myths. Myths about two doctors and the techniques they used. Myths about the children they examined. And myths about happy families broken up by predatory social workers. I think the biggest myth, uh, which is still unfortunately <laughs> persisting, is that uh, children for some reason would turn up at Middlesbrough General Hospital with a sore finger or an earache. And before they knew where they were, they were having their bottoms examined and being declared <laughs> sexually abused. The reality is very different. The stereotype, I would say, was wholly inaccurate. That in fact, there was very considerable concern about many of the children involved prior to them being seen by doctors. The second myth was that doctors relied on one discredited sign, reflex anal dilatation, RAD, to diagnose all the children. But that was the myth that was taken ahead, and most people think Cleveland RAD, rubbish sign. That was inaccurate. Um, the sign has not been discredited. It is a sign that is in forensic textbooks, and we do now increasingly understand why it happens. And the most persistent myth of all, the myth that all the parents were innocent and wrongly torn from their children. Some of the children had been abused, yes, and anyone applying reason to those situations would come to that conclusion. But behind the myths, one bitter truth, adults' voices are always louder than children's. 
nobody thought about poor children or involved. Nobody thought we listen to the children and see what their story is. It was all the parents and the children weren't listened to. At the heart of the crisis were two paediatricians, Marietta Higgs and Geoffrey Wyatt, and their medical diagnoses of abuse on 121 children. Ten years on, neither doctor is free to take part in this film. Cleveland was about pioneering work. We were working at the frontiers of knowledge and the development of knowledge about child sexual abuse. Sue Richardson was appointed child abuse consultant for Cleveland County Council in 1986. Child sexual abuse had only recently become a registration category on the child abuse register and there were no guidelines as such as to how it should be dealt with. Sue Richardson has never spoken out before and risks her career in doing so now. Cleveland was the first major um, event, as it were, that brought the whole issue onto the public agenda. It was also the start of the backlash in this country uh, against professionals for their actions. Although there had been prosecutions for sexual abuse, Cleveland Police and Social Services traditionally relied on children to make an initial complaint. The result was a tide of undiscovered abuse cases waiting to break. Ruth was one of Cleveland's undetected victims of sexual abuse. Although she was not one of the 121 children caught up in the crisis, she knows what many of them were going through. I was threatened by my father that um, if I told, I would be called a liar. Any child abuser will put the responsibility on the child that the abuse is their fault and that the responsibility for keeping it secret is their responsibility. As adults, we don't give a child the responsibility to diagnose a broken limb if they've fallen. And it seems unfair to wait for a child to tell you that they've been abused if they don't have the words, or if they can't, or if they daren't, or if they're frightened. To break this vicious circle of silence, social workers referred children to the paediatricians at Middlesbrough General Hospital. Marietta Higgs' training on how to recognise medical evidence of abuse on young children's bodies was viewed as a breakthrough. Here for the first time was the possibility of um, closing a loophole which uh, abusers had relied on for many years, that uh, little children would be unable to tell and that they would be able to abuse children without anyone finding out. So it was an enormous breakthrough for children. One of the techniques used by Dr. Higgs was called reflex anal dilatation, a simple test to see whether a child's anus showed signs of recent penetration. And the anus is normally tightly closed uh, with radiating skin folds. And in a young child, after sort of 10, 12 seconds, the external sphincter relaxes, but you can't sing up into the rectum because the internal sphincter is closed. But in fact, if the child has been only abused, the internal sphincter may relapse too, and the whole rectum dilate up, and you can see it right up into the rectum, and that's a sign, reflex anal dilatation. This was a new presentation for me, really, because many of the children were very young, and they hadn't made an alerting comment, or if they had, it hadn't been brought to anyone's attention. So, in effect, they hadn't made any disclosures. The first children to be diagnosed by Dr. Higgs were two little girls aged four and two. Their family, later given the code letter M, had worried social workers for nearly three years. The elder child had been admitted to hospital seven times for failure to thrive. It culminated, I think, at a time when the health visitor was shown a lot of bruising. A lot of bruising, <laughs> like 60-something bruise, little bruises on a child. 
When she examined the older girl, Dr. Higgs found evidence that the child had also been sexually abused. Both children were taken into care and placed with a foster family in Middlesbrough. For four years, social services and police had been at loggerheads over the investigation of suspected sexual abuse. There was a backlog of conflict surrounding the police and the police surgeons, specifically about the police and social work cooperation in joint investigations and the role of the police surgeon. I think there was a, a reluctance to give up turf, to, to hand over one's territory. The police were very concerned that they wanted to remain in charge of any investigations and the police surgeons likewise wanted to be in charge of the medical investigation. Dr Alistair Irvin, a local GP, was senior police surgeon for Cleveland. In March 1987, he secretly warned the police not to trust Dr Higgs and the increasing number of sexual abuse diagnoses she was making. Within weeks, those numbers would rise dramatically. In May, the two children from the M family were re-examined prior to a court hearing. Dr Higgs found new signs of anal abuse in both children. If the abuse had happened whilst the children were in their foster home, all the children in that house were potentially at risk. As a result of that, further inquiries were made into circumstances in the foster home and the foster parents' children were also seen and examined and it appeared that they too had been subject of sexual abuse. A paediatrician from outside Cleveland examined the children and confirmed the diagnoses. Some of the children had abnormal genital signs, some of them had abnormal anal signs, some of them had both abnormal genital and anal signs. And so I was able to do a clinical examination. We photographed the children, so we had documentation there. And then I wrote up my opinion as to what the physical signs were, what they might be consistent with. But a crisis was brewing. From seeing only a handful of cases, Middlesbrough General Hospital was now struggling to cope with several referrals a day. On May the 21st, a family of three children, code-lettered AA-E, was referred to Marietta Higgs after the eldest girl made a partial disclosure. She was describing sexual intercourse going on in her bed, adults having intercourse in her bed, and uh, she described stains on the sheets and things, which a small child wouldn't have understood about. Uh, at that stage. But that was the kind of concern that we had, that things were happening in that house which the children shouldn't have had sight of, really, <laughs> shouldn't have known about. With her mother's consent, Dr Higgs examined the girl. She found evidence of gross damage to her vagina and anus. But before she could examine the two younger children, their father, already on police bail for unrelated offences, stormed onto the ward father's response to, to Dr Higgs finding signs, as she felt, of sexual abuse, that he just removed the children and hid them, and then uh, got the police and, and uh, the police surgeon to, to come and examine the children again. Social workers immediately obtained a place of safety order, but the police refused to implement it. Instead, police surgeons carried out a secret examination of the children. They saw no evidence of abuse. There was uh, such a dispute over the medical diagnosis uh, that really the, it was difficult for the police to accept that the, ch the children needed to be investigated for child sexual abuse. And as a result, um, those, that particular family of children suffered greatly because of the conflict between the doctors. The way in which they suffered is that they ended up being medically examined and re-examined um, four or five times. The opposition to Dr Higgs' diagnoses was led by senior police surgeon Alistair Irvin. On May the 28th, Sue Richardson called a meeting to try and resolve the conflict. 
There was myself and two or three very senior police officers present and the meeting uh, degenerated into the most um, appalling situation I've ever been in in my professional career as, where Dr Irving was calling Dr Higgs incompetent and misguided, uh, demanding that I choose between them and um, generally getting out, out of control and in a very emotionally heated state. Immediately after the meeting, Cleveland police issued a secret memo telling its officers to treat with caution any diagnosis of sexual abuse made by Dr. Higgs. Social services issued their own confidential memo instructing staff to bypass the police surgeons and seek a place of safety order whenever a diagnosis was made. I suppose, really, it was the wrong use of a place of safety order because it was fundamentally to protect the children from the police and police surgeons and repeated medical examinations. From then on, the police increasingly withdrew from any investigations. Eventually, um, they simply uh, took their bat home. There's no other way of, of putting it. And they became increasingly reluctant to investigate cases at all. Uh, things were said to parents that the doctors, the paediatricians' diagnoses were not to be relied on. Uh, parents reported that to me, that they didn't know what to think, they didn't know what to believe because a paediatrician had told them one thing and then a police officer had come along and told them not to take that seriously. Um, and, and it was causing a, a absolute chaos, really particularly with the police being warned off um, and told not to believe what was happening. Um, that caused splinters and splintering of, of all the good work that had been done. And unfortunately, the children were the ones that were left in the middle and they were the ones that suffered. As a child, I didn't really think about how somebody would make the abuse stop. Um, as a child, adults are so powerful and they can fix things, they can make things better and that's what I wanted was for them to fix it and make it better. For me, if an adult had been able to believe me and act on that belief, whether it was a belief founded on medical evidence or because of verbal disclosure, to believe me and make the abuse stop would have been all of my wishes at once. By the end of May 1987, child protection in Cleveland was at a standstill. Prompted by their senior police surgeon, Cleveland Constabulary had virtually withdrawn from any investigations into sexual abuse diagnosed by paediatricians Marietta Higgs and Jeffrey Wyatt. It produced complete stalemate, really. It meant that no matter how hard we tried in the social services department to gather evidence, to interview children, and no matter how hard police officers on the ground worked to the same end, and some of them still did, that at the end of the day we would still be left in the middle of a row between doctors. In June, the case of a five-year-old girl typified the standoff. The girl's father had served prison sentences for sexually abusing three other young girls. Dr. Higgs found unequivocal medical evidence of recent abuse. Almost immediately, 
the little girl, given the code letter I.I., described how her father repeatedly molested her. The child was living in the same household as a convicted offender. Um, she had given a very clear disclosure. There were other worrying symptoms that she'd had. The mother believed her and could provide some supportive evidence. Um, and there were medical findings. So in many ways, what more could any police officer or any other professional for that matter ever want? But because their police surgeon had warned them not to trust Dr. Higgs' diagnoses, Cleveland police refused to prosecute the girl's father, despite her clear disclosure to a police officer. She told me she had a poorly tuppence, which was caused by her father moving his fingers up and down inside. She stated that this had been going on for some time. In my opinion, there is no doubt he is responsible for this assault, but with the present policy, I was unable to charge him. If you don't have the police element in a multidisciplinary investigation, you can't do anything about the perpetrator. We had children here where we had no named abuser. We didn't know what we were protecting them from. It meant, sometimes it meant taking them away from home simply because we had no idea who the perpetrator was. The result was an extraordinary increase in the numbers of children admitted to Middlesbrough General Hospital. My reaction to the numbers, uh, the size of the problem that was being uncovered, was a, it, it surprised me really in that I, I thought this can't be true. But I was aware with a lot of the children that there had been ongoing concern for a long time about other problems and I had to remind myself of that. The case of three children, two girls and a boy, later given the code letter X, was all too typical. Social services had been worried about them for more than a year when the eldest girl had what appeared to be an accident. It started by, we were lighting the fire in the backyard and my daughter was sat on uh, a bench set that we had. And as the flames hit quite high, high level, she fell, she jumped and fell and hurt herself between the legs. The girl, who was then five, was taken to Middlesbrough General Hospital. Casualty staff referred her to the paediatricians for a full examination. We were seen by Dr Wyatt, and he told us that she'd been sexually abused. And he demanded that we go home and get the other two children and bring them. Dr Wyatt's examination revealed evidence consistent with non-accidental injuries, as well as signs of anal and vaginal abuse told us he was going to get a second opinion and he produced Dr Higgs who came up and examined the children and said exactly the same thing. He said the children were dirty, filthy, underweight, underweight disgusting children. I was, I was that angry. I pinned him up against the wall. It was really, I just couldn't believe it. Well, when parents react like that, it's, it's very difficult for children to tell anybody what is actually happening to them. It places the children in a situation of impossible conflict because almost whatever they do or say um, won't be accepted or believed by someone, which is why we tried to remove the, the children to a more neutral environment by admitting them onto a hospital ward where they would be able to um, talk over with someone neutral what had actually happened to them. But as the children bedded down on the hospital ward, their parents banded together to deny even the possibility of abuse. And in their local MP, they soon found a powerful champion. We were supported by and Stuart Bell, MP for Middlesbrough, and it was brilliant. He was uh, one hell of a man. Stuart Bell was extremely in influential at that time because he had such a high profile in the media. He was everywhere. Whenever we wrote to him, he'd write straight back to us. He actually came and seen us. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. He was at Middlesbrough General. He was, he was everywhere. Where the parents were, he was there. Then, on June the 26th, the previously local dispute between the police surgeon and the paediatricians became a national controversy. Dr Alistair Irvin is the senior police surgeon for Cleveland, and today he spoke out against the actions of the paediatrician at the centre of the child abuse row, Dr Marietta Higgs. 
The Rao centered on reflex anal dilatation. Dr. Irvin claimed the technique was new, unreliable and controversial. My views have the support of the majority of my colleagues working in the, in the field of abuse, the, the, my experienced police surgeons and others. The, the views of Dr. Higgs are, to say the least, very controversial views, which are not widely had, held at all. But Dr. Irvin was wrong. His own professional body, the Police Surgeons Association, advised its members that RAD should arouse strong suspicion that abuse has occurred. Other major medical bodies also endorsed it. RAD is an established physical sign in buggery. It's been in the forensic textbooks for tens of years, uh, and it has gradually been refined to understand why it occurs. What is important, of course, is you cannot rely on that physical sign alone. But it is my understanding that that did not happen and that other factors were appearing in these cases rather than just the physical sign. The increasing vehemence with which Dr. Irvin opposed almost any diagnosis made by Dr. Higgs led social workers to doubt the reliability of his judgments. Sometimes a police surgeon would see precisely the same um, child or the same slides or the same reports and not see, in inverted commas, the same thing, would see something that, um, in, particularly in Dr. Irving's case, that he thought was normal. So uh, a, a torn anus or anal fissures uh, and things like that which in a very young child, for example, for which there isn't a very easy or obvious explanation, Dr. Irving would not um, feel at the same level of concern about that. But the social worker's decision to bypass the police surgeons drew immediate criticism. Mr Stuart Bell, is the Minister of State aware that it was Dr Marietta Higgs, a consultant paediatrician in healthcare on Teesside, and Mrs Sue Richardson of Cleveland Social Services, who colluded and conspired to keep the police out of allegations of sexual abuse Throughout that summer, MPs fanned the flames of an increasingly bitter row. Richard Holt, would not my honourable friend feel? Mr. Tim Devlin, the innocent well, rights, parents, rights, the innocent children, and those parents who are afraid to take their children to I'm hospitals sure now in South Bell. Bell. in case that they may find themselves in a similar situation. If the two doctors involved were to be suspended... Consultant paediatrician Dr Marietta Higgs, since May the 1st, 197 cases have been Today declined once again to be interviewed. But the parents of many of these children are now speaking out. On the dramatic Some rise in the number of abuse cases she's diagnosed. She was extremely upset after our... If my daughter, three-year-old, has been abused... What's your reaction to the fact that they could take your son for two months? people have allowed to have been in hospital now nine days. My wife slept... Reporters appeared to make no effort to verify the parents' stories, and mothers who accepted the doctor's diagnoses were never interviewed. A lot of people were shouting about how Dr Higgs had diagnosed the children and was splitting the families up. To me, it was more a vendetta against Dr Higgs than the fact that the child abuse had been discovered. Behind the doors of his home, Jean's husband abused their three daughters, all under eight years old, and pressured them never to talk about the abuse. The eldest one closed up, wouldn't talk to anybody, wouldn't say anything. Um, the middle one, oh, we, we tried to find out of her if anybody had been doing anything that shouldn't and all she kept saying was that the eldest one her had a secret and the eldest one would hit her if she told us the secret. Only Dr Higgs' medical intervention and Jean's acceptance of it stopped the abuse and allowed the children to be protected. I praised Dr Higgs all the way through. Uh, I was grateful to her for diagnosing my children so early on. And I just think she saved quite a few children uh, from being abused. Soon, hostile reporting came to dictate the course of the Cleveland crisis and to drive the courts before it.
the protection of children depends on the climate of public opinion. Um, the law is, uh, the courts are not immune from it. Uh, it's, it's the crucial deciding factor, really, as to whether child sexual abuse will be dealt with or not. And the way in which the public hysteria was whipped up by the media meant that the, the cases didn't have a chance, really. One judge, for example, said that he um, intended to hear the case by the standards of criminal evidence, the standard of criminal evidence being beyond reasonable doubt, and the, the standard that should prevail in children's cases, the balance of probabilities. The, the judge felt that because of the controversial nature of the, the cases at the time, he had to go for a criminal standard of evidence. Another judge said that she lived in the area, uh, read the newspapers, and was bound to be influenced by what she read and heard. By mid-June, courts were faced with a conflict in medical evidence. Police surgeons retained by the families attacked the paediatricians' diagnoses, especially RAD. Soon, the judges turned a deaf ear to doctors Higgs and Wyatt. The family given the code letter X were amongst the first to be reunited in a blaze of publicity. We had people from TVM, um, BBC One, Town Seas, all covering the story. Because I think we were one of the, the first families to actually get the children back. How do you feel about the verdict? Fantastic. It's what we've been waiting for. We've actually achieved it now. We're getting them over, that's it. We were in cough for two weeks. The judge came back and he just told me, he just said, this family was a very happy family until all of you interfered with their lives. He said, I have no alternative but to send these children back to the parents. But that decision flew in the face of allegations held in the family's social services file, evidence which has never been properly tested. Ten years on, the parents deny it. They said that your kids had dug up the floorboards of their house and set fire to it. No, that's wrong. They said that you, the, the children had an uncle who had abused other children when he was 12. No. No. <laughs> totally. Unbelievable. They said that the kids were underweight. Yeah, that's what Dr. White had said. Um, and they said that your son had bruises all over him. No. Load, load of rubbish. And they said that he'd drawn a picture for an NSPCC officer of a man, apparently, in their words, buggering a boy. No. We, we love the children, and there's no way we would do anything to them children whatsoever. Me, my family, anybody. Once the courts rejected the paediatrician's evidence, the county council abandoned many of its cases, laying itself open to compensation claims even where the children had disclosed abuse. A situation developed where the ca cases either um, were proven or fell on the basis of medical evidence alone. Other supportive evidence, mainly which we held in the social services department, started to be screened out. We would have had statements from the child, the social workers and a child psychologists' evidence from interviewing, which were completely aside from the medical findings. Are you saying that evidence about children's safety was not presented to courts? which subsequently returned those children. Yes, I am saying that very clearly. Um, in some cases, evidence was not put in the court. In other cases, um, agreements were made between lawyers uh, not to put the case to the court at all, particularly as the crisis developed latterly, that children were sent home um, subject to informal agreements um, or agreements between lawyers. The cases never even got as far as the court. The two little girls from the M family, the very first children in the crisis, were amongst the casualties. Despite the bruises on their bodies, and despite a clear disclosure of abuse, they were handed back to their parents unprotected. There was a, a one young child in that household who did make what I thought was a, a very clear statement being, being four. Um, she said that um, Daddy had put a toy in her bottom 
And when she was asked what the toy was, she said, it's an extra leg on Daddy. And I thought that was pretty graphic and believable. And as I understand it, that evidence was never presented to the court because the medical evidence was disputed and the trial, or the, the case, was finished without the disclosure evidence being heard. It, it was just the worst, I think the worst thing that ever happened to me was, was with all the concerns I had had. The sexual abuse in a way was unimportant. It seems a terrible thing to say, but that was just another worry. I had had such concerns about the family and they were returned and I don't know what's happened to them now. The adult system let the children down in Cleveland and didn't protect them against what I believed was a real risk of abuse. And that was all a collective adult responsibility. It wasn't the children's fault, but the children were the ones that were punished. By July 1987, public hysteria over child abuse had paralysed Cleveland social services, the police and the courts. We were presenting the public with something which they didn't want to hear about. They didn't want to know it was too difficult, too demanding, too threatening. It made people feel fearful and it made them go on the defensive. If the cases had been dealt with in a calmer atmosphere and environment, it's likely, in my opinion, that on the balance of probabilities, abuse, it would have been held that abuse had occurred and more active steps taken to protect the children. On July the 7th, Middlesbrough MP Stuart Bell held a televised press conference announcing he was to deliver to government ministers a dossier detailing the cases of 19 families. This report, which I have before me, is a an indictment of certain individuals within the health service and an indictment of certain individuals within the social services. What I am asking the Minister to do is to have a full inquiry into all aspects of this affair. I, I am worried about the political power that seemed to be wielded in the Cleveland crisis and I find that very frightening. I find that personally frightening, that our work can be so interfered with. But how accurate was the information in Mr. Bell's dossier? Of the 19 families he supported, seven included children who had already disclosed abuse. Three included an adult male who had already been charged with sexual abuse, and two more involved families where the father was a convicted child sex offender. That really shakes me. I'm, I had no knowledge of that. Um, 
I knew that the dossier was to be presented. Indeed, I did ask Stuart if, uh, if I could have a copy. Uh, he refused. He said that I could look at the cases which originated in my constituency. I pointed out to him that, uh, according to parliamentary protocol, I should indeed be handling them. Um, he refused to divulge any details on any of those cases. But if Mr. Bell kept his dossier secret from his fellow MPs, he publicized it widely and lobbied hard on behalf of the parents. He wrote to the parents of a family code-lettered AF whose children had been taken into care. No one would wish your children to be separated from their parents. In fact, the father had already been cautioned by the police for hitting the children, and a team of independent experts had concluded that separation was the only way to protect these children from their parents. I don't understand why Stuart Bell would choose to support adults who are accused of abusing their children without being very sure himself of whether or not the children were abused. I think somebody like my father going to an MP would very probably have come across as being very plausible and being the victim instead of the perpetrator. Two days after Mr Bell presented his dossier, the government announced a judicial inquiry. Mr Speaker, I will, with permission, make a statement about child abuse in Cleveland. We have concluded that there should be a full inquiry into the arrangements for dealing with suspected cases of child abuse in Cleveland, headed by a High Court judge. The inquiry under Lord Justice Butler Sloss began hearings in August. At the same time, courts in Cleveland were still hearing several of the cases. Amongst those giving evidence to both was Cleveland's senior police surgeon. Dr. Alistair Irvin had sparked the crisis by denouncing RAD as an indicator of sexual abuse, but at the inquiry he made a startling U-turn. There is one thing I want to clarify, madam. Although I do not consider anal dilatation in itself to be diagnostic, I do accept that it is suspicious that it is an indicator to investigate further. But if the police surgeon's opposition to RAD was now in doubt, the inquiry seemed powerless to pass this on to the courts. A clear decision was made by Butler Sloss at the beginning of the inquiry that nothing uh, that was said in the inquiry should be relayed to the High Court, that the her set, one set of proceedings should not be allowed to influence the other. Nor was it only Dr. Irvin's evidence that was kept within the inquiry. On occasion, parents gave conflicting and inconsistent evidence in the inquiry and in the High Court, but only those of us were, that were present knew about that. The High Court wasn't allowed to know that um, perhaps some parents might have incriminated themselves or said things that were inconsistent with what they were being told in that other setting. And the central question, whether the 121 children had been abused, was never on the Butler Sloss inquiry's agenda. The inquiry wasn't set up to look at the cases. It was to look at the management of the cases. I think very many of us really wanted to tell the inquiry a lot of things about the children. I wanted to tell the inquiry how it was for the children, not just what they said about abuse, but what they were going through, and that didn't seem to be relevant at all. But detailed information on each of the 121 children was presented to the inquiry, in secret. Cleveland County Council drew up a computerised database on all the children. The purpose of the database was to collate information for the subsequent uh, Butler Sloss inquiry of all of the details of children referred to the social services department for suspected forms of abuse. I examined most of the files of the children involved and there was definite evidence that various forms of abuse were suspected 
before referral either to doctors or to anyone else. The inquiry report criticised the paediatricians and social services management of the crisis, the police surgeons for dismissing RAD and MP Stuart Bell for inflaming public opinion with unsupported allegations. It said nothing about the children themselves. With permission, Mr Speaker, I wish to make a statement about the report by Lord Justice Butler Sloss on the findings of her inquiry into the handling of suspected child abuse cases. On July the 6th, 1988, Health Minister Tony Newton told the House of Commons that some children remained wards of court, but there was no verdict on how many had been abused. Uh, the report uh, I have in, in front of me says, we understand that out of the 121 children, uh, those are the children diagnosed by Drs Higgs and Wyatt, uh, 98 are now at home. I think at the time that statement was made, it was true that 96 children had been returned home to their families, but the majority of them were subject to high court orders of one sort or another, or restrictions in some instances were placed on certain members of the family not to have contact with them, or they were under the supervision of the social services department. What do those restrictions imply to you? Well, it implied that the, the court felt there was a case to answer at that time and that the, the children might well be at risk and needed to be protected. The Department of Health also received independent evidence suggesting that the majority of the children had been abused. Independent panels set up to give second opinions on the diagnoses by doctors Higgs and Wyatt reported the paediatricians had been correct in at least 70 to 75 percent of the cases. I only learned of this report uh, about two and a half weeks ago. And I've got to tell you that I was greatly pleased to learn of it. I wasn't privy to its existence, let alone its contents. Uh, had we known then, I think it would have made a major difference, uh, not only to the Children's Act, which came about later, but also to the, that debate specifically. The public has not had the information put before it. It's my belief that it's been actively withheld and concealed. If the truth were known, then I think Cleveland would be an even greater scandal than people already imagine it to be. The scandal would be that children were not protected from severe, horrendous abuse. Instead, parents have ever since been given licence to attack the paediatricians and social workers. Now, seven years ago, parents throughout the country were stunned when hundreds of allegations of child abuse were revealed in the county of Cleveland within a few weeks. Hello. This couple used a BBC so, chat show to complain of being kept from their son. He could be watching now. I hope what I... do you want to say to him? Which camera are we on? That one there. Wherever you are, if you're watching this, and your friends, I want you to know one thing, your family love you very dearly. Come home and get away from those very evil people who got you in captivity. The truth about this man is that he's been convicted of sexual assaults on a young girl and that a High Court judge ruled he had repeatedly buggered his son, sometimes in front of his wife. It was like being in Alice in Wonderland or Alice through the looking glass that nothing made sense anymore and you never knew what was going to happen next. Two years after the crisis, Cleveland County Council checked its records to follow up on the 121 children. Despite the disputed medical evidence, courts had ruled 93 of the children had been at risk of abuse. Only 28 had been sent home, either with a ruling that no abuse had taken place or with no conditions attached. The council found that many of the children had since been re-referred to its social services department. We found, in fact, 25 of the children had been referred and of those, five had been re-referred for sexual abuse. From what I knew of the families in 1987, the re-referrals didn't surprise me at all. And some of the indications with the families, there was, there was very strong evidence that various forms of abuse had occurred to some of the children. And it was no surprise to me at all that in 1989, some of them had been re-referred to the department. The council sent details of the re-referrals to the Department of Health, but then a joint decision was taken that no further follow-up was to be carried out on the Cleveland children. All records relating to them as a group were destroyed. I'm astonished and dumbfounded and frankly, I, I'm, I shall try. 
out of charity to try to find some kind of justification within logic which might warrant that decision. I don't know who took it. I know all the principals who were involved in it. If I ever find out who took it and I meet them again, they'll have a piece of my mind. It was quite deliberately designed that nobody would know and nobody would find out. There were no arrangements made for follow-up. Um, the data has become scattered and dispersed and I think that those children have been sacrificed. I believe that the children that I saw with the medical evidence to show that they were abused were abused. Yes, I still believe that. I believe that more now than I did at the time, if anything, because I know how it works now. I know what silences children. I know how they feel. The fate of the 121 Cleveland children remains a secret. Child protection workers who try to speak for them have been silenced. In 1990, Cleveland County Council made Sue Richardson redundant. Last week, she resigned from her job at the NCH Action for Children charity after it told her she risked dismissal for taking part in this film. Cleveland has left a legacy of fear, a climate of fear and anxiety, that if you stick your neck out on behalf of abused children and they need adults to do that for them, then you, you just might get your own head blown off. Dr. Alistair Irvin and MP Stuart Bell declined to be interviewed for this film. Geoffrey Wyatt is still working as a paediatrician in Cleveland, but is banned from any child abuse cases. Last year, an internal inquiry by his health trust concluded the ban puts a small number of children at risk. The ban remains in force. Marietta Higgs was never allowed to return to Cleveland. Earlier this year, she was appointed paediatrician at Dumfries Infirmary. Her health trust told her it did not want her to take part in this film. The trust said it feared the public response. My understanding of the Cleveland crisis was... was basically that in the same way that I was being told to be quiet and keep it secret and not tell, I was aware that Marietta Higgs was being called a liar and that she was being made to be quiet and to keep secrets by the adults who had more power over her. Two years ago, Ruth's father was jailed for seven years for abusing her throughout her childhood. During the trial, Defence barristers tried to persuade the jury Ruth's allegations could not be believed because she came from Cleveland. 